Today we'll be talking about chapter 3, section 4. The title of this is The French and Indian War. And you could arguably call this the First World War. Not the actual First World War from 1914 to 1918, but um, the first global conflict involving both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. It started as a European conflict between Britain and France over territories, yet it boiled over into the American colonies and became one of the leading reasons that colonists would cite as to why they wanted to leave Great Britain. Um, but British victories over the French in North America enlarged the British Empire. Um, in fact, the French and Indian War wasn't an isolated incident. There had been multiple conflicts with, between Britain and France dating back hundreds of years. Uh, we're simply part of the latest one and being caught up in yet another string of European conflicts that many colonists came here to avoid. Today we'll be talking about chapter 3, section 4. The title of this is The French and Indian War. And you could arguably call this the First World War. Not the actual First World War from 1914 to 1918, but um, the first global conflict involving both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. It started as a European conflict between Britain and France over territories, yet it boiled over into the American colonies and became one of the leading reasons that colonists would cite as to why they wanted to leave Great Britain. Um, but British victories over the French in North America enlarged the British Empire. Um, in fact, the French and Indian War wasn't an isolated incident. There had been multiple conflicts with, between Britain and France dating back hundreds of years. Uh, we're simply part of the latest one and being caught up in yet another string of European conflicts that many colonists came here to avoid. So we need to understand how this war started and um, why it involves American history. It is unfortunate that so many colonists came here to escape the endless string of violence that had plagued Western Europe for thousands of years. And yet, here American colonists find themselves yet again caught up in conflicts dating back centuries that many came here to avoid. Now throughout the 1750s, Britain and France were busy building empires in the New World. Uh, both were fighting over the Ohio River Valley. And um, both Britain and France wanted to expand their empires into this territory. Now for the British colonies, there was a great desire to expand the British colonies westward into the Ohio River Valley. The colonists generally favored this expansion as well because it would give colonists more territory to expand, more frontier to conquer and occupy. But also because that was the stated British policy and colonists considered themselves loyal British subjects, they were willing to go along with this expansionist policy into the Ohio River Valley. Native Americans were caught up in this conflict on both sides. Some fought for the French, some fought for the British. There were military alliances between tribes of both groups. And in order to honor those military alliances, Native Americans would be called upon to help either side. Well, of course, 
whichever side won, those Native American tribes would benefit from being part of an alliance that was victorious. The tribes that supported Great Britain and the French and Indian War did benefit from that alliance. Now meanwhile, France had a significant amount of territory in North America. The St. Lawrence River region, the Mississippi Valley, even land west of the Appalachians, the French Broad River Valley belonged to the French. Now, in 1754, the French colonies in the New World were called New France. Had a relatively small population. In fact, most French citizens living in this part of the country would have been fur trappers would have been explorers, would have been nomadic primarily. So there, this area is very sparsely populated by French citizens, mainly traveling around the Blue Ridge Mountains, mainly looking uh, to trap small animals to take their furs and to sell them for trade. Um, there were a handful of Catholic missionaries, Jesuit priests, setting up missions throughout the um, French Broad River Valley, uh, throughout the um, western side of the Appalachians. And generally, the French had good relations as well as military alliances with many of the natives. In fact, many of the Native Americans will lose big time uh, for supporting the French in this war. Now, when the war began, there had already been two separate conflicts between the French and the British already in the 1700s. These two nations have been in a period of conflict and rivalry throughout their history. From the beginning of the nation of France, from the beginning of the nation of Britain, these two nations were at each other's throats. Now, the French had a fort established in the Ohio River Valley called Fort Duquesne, and even though this land had already been claimed by the Virginia Company, the French occupied this region. General George Washington was sent with an envoy of British colonial soldiers to approach Fort Duquesne and order the French to leave. The French refused. General Washington was ordered to take the fort by force and he was beaten. And this was considered the first bloodshed in the French and Indian War, a war that would lead to over one million casualties by its end. So it's called the French and Indian War here in the American colonies. Globally, it's also called the Seven Years War because it was part of a larger conflict that we were caught up in. So early French victories included the Battle of Fort Duquesne, included the ambush of General Edward Braddock's army near the fort, which was also the uh, basis for the movie Last of the Mohicans. Uh, General Braddock plays prominently in that film. And the British actually lost repeatedly to the French as well as their native allies throughout this conflict. Now, as I said, natives were caught up on both sides. Um, famous British general, worth noting, is William Pitt. Uh, he helped the British win many battles. In fact, um, partly as a result of Pitt's victories, partly as a result of uh, the British history in the northeastern region. The Iroquois joined the British in this conflict and benefited 
substantially. In fact, the Iroquois would maintain a degree of independence until the late 1700s. In 1759, the British captured the French colony of Quebec, which is now part of the British Commonwealth still today. Canada is still considered a part of the British Commonwealth, though they retain their independence culturally, they identify as British. Quebec included, even though they speak French there. Eventually, with the British capture of Quebec, the French were realizing this conflict wasn't worth the investment they were spending. And eventually, the French decided and met with the British at the Treaty of Paris <coughs> to end the war in 1763. The result of this war is that the lands that had formerly been French colonies would be divided between Britain and Spain. Britain gained all of Canada and virtually all of North America east of the Mississippi. Now west of the Mississippi would still belong to Spain. In fact this is why uh, many people in the southwestern United States today speak Spanish because they were part of a Spanish colony in Mexico until Mexico declared its independence and still retained much of that Spanish identity. And uh, in fact, the territories of New Mexico and Texas and Arizona and California would retain their Mexican identity until the mid-1850s when America conquered those regions from Mexico, which we'll be talking about soon. Uh, but anyway, Britain lost the respect of many of the colonists. Though they won the war, this is considered one of the turning points to the eventual defeat and independence uh, for the American colonies from the British. Basically, yeah, basically the world. And the why? Ostensibly land. British colonists wanted to expand into land west of the original 13 colonies. And that land was technically held by the French who left it alone except for a bunch of trading posts and they were like, je ne veux pas l'anglais. Thank you, four years of high school French. Anyway, the war wasn't really about land. It was really about our old friend, trade. The British wanted to expand into the American interior to allow for more colonists because the British benefited both from the export of raw materials from the Americas and the import of British consumer goods to the Americas. So more colonists meant more trade, which meant more wealth, which meant ever fancier hats. And the French realized that this British Atlantic maritime trade was making Britain so rich that Britain might come for France's actually valuable colonies, which were not in the continental US, but those slave-based sugar plantations in the Caribbean. So the fighting began around here, and while the British did send over actual British troops, much of the early fighting was done by colonial militias. Probably the most famous commander of British troops was a Virginia colonel named George Washington. In fact, he may have actually started the shooting at the Battle of Fort Necessity in May of 1754. Washington was captured in that battle, but then he was immediately released because 18th century war was super weird. Anyway, the real North American action was in New York and Canada. At the Battle at the Plains of Abraham in 1759, for instance, the British defeated the French and captured the city of Quebec. Both the British commander General Wolfe and the French commander General Montcalm were killed in that battle with the death of the former being immortalized in this famous painting by Benjamin West. As indicated by the picture, almost all the battles in North America featured significant participation by Native Americans. Different Native tribes sided with both the British and the French, but as a broad generalization, Native Americans were more likely to support the French. Up to this point, shrewd Indian tribes had been able to play the British and the French off each other and maintain a degree of autonomy for themselves. And as long as the French were present, the British were prevented from encroaching too much on lands Native Americans were using for hunting and agriculture. Now we haven't talked much about American Indians, mostly because they were geographically isolated and didn't have a written language, but let's at least give them a thought bubble. Before the arrival of the Europeans, most Native Americans lived in tribal groups, and they subsisted on a combination of small-scale agriculture and hunting and gathering, depending on where they were situated. There were too many tribes to generalize about specific social structures, but it's probably safe to say that in terms of gender, they were much more egalitarian than the Europeans who they met up with, which may explain why European women who were taken captive by Indians sometimes preferred to stay with the tribe rather than be rescued, although that's somewhat controversial. One thing we can say about the Indians, their notions of what it meant to hold property were very different from those of the Europeans. Individual Indians did not own land in the European sense. 
they used it, and not always particularly intensively. Europeans, when they came to North America, had a hard time even recognizing that the Indians were raising crops because their forms of farming were so different from European agriculture. So the French, and especially the English, just assumed that the Indians weren't improving the land, which meant that they didn't own the land, so that meant that it was okay for Europeans to take it. As you might imagine, that was problematic for the Indians. In general, Indian tribes initially got along better with the French than with the Dutch or English because one, the French did not settle in large numbers as they were mostly traders and fur trappers, and two, French missionaries who made the journey to the Americas were Catholic, often Jesuits, who were so intent on converting the Indians that they took the time to learn Indian languages and try to make Catholicism more amenable to Indian religion. The end result of the war, a greatly reduced French presence on the American mainland, meant that Indians could no longer easily play the British and French off each other, which opened the floodgates of British settlers. In the end, the American Indians were perhaps the biggest losers of the Seven Years' War. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So 2,000 miles south in the Caribbean, there was also quite a lot of fighting between the British and the French over sugar colonies. Most of these were naval battles, and by 1761, Spain got involved because, you know, they had some sugar colonies of their own. While these battles get a lot of ink, it's interesting to note that by far the greatest threat to combatants was disease. By October of 1761, the British had lost about a thousand men to war war and so throughout the entire war total casualties from both sides included roughly one million people so a significant loss of life was experienced on all sides um, though perhaps as John Green said the biggest loser in the war were the Native American tribes who had been able to play the British and French off each other and maintain a degree of autonomy but now after the war was over the British dominated North America and would continue to encroach on their lands. Uh, France did lose big in this war, lost all of their territories in the Americas, but not only had the natives lost in regards to uh, territories, but they also lost the respect of the British because so many had sided with the French. And so many would lose the protection of the British as a result of this war as well. And so British victory actually brought quite a few problems. For one, the leader of the Ottawa tribe, fearing a loss of land, went on to capture several British forts. And so right after the French and Indian War came to a conclusion, now the British colonists and American colonists, by default, find themselves at war with other Native American groups. The British would resort to some terribly nasty tactics to win this war. Biological warfare has been around perhaps as long as warfare itself. And though the British didn't understand microbiology, they understood that smallpox was a terrible disease and very contagious and blankets that had been used from smallpox victims could spread smallpox. They understood that victims of smallpox could spread smallpox. They understood that it was highly contagious. And so they actually used this as a biological weapon and the Native Americans were decimated in this war. Uh, eventually the war between the Ottawas and the British uh, which the Ottawas, by the way, live in what is today Quebec. There's a river called the Ottawa River up there. And um, this conflict was eventually settled with the Proclamation of 1763, stating that colonists cannot settle any further west than the Appalachian Mountains. Though this did give colonists access to territories that had formerly been French, ergo the French Broad River Valley. Anybody you know why it's called the French Broad? You ever thought about that aside from the fact that you just... Wars are terribly expensive, and this war was no exception. Agreements made with the Native Americans to halt hostilities angered colonists who wanted to expand westward of the Appalachians. The British also needed to raise funds to pay for these massive war debts. And part of the process of raising money was to crack down on smuggling, so they had to start rounding up colonial pirates. 
And this crackdown on smuggling also increased tensions in Massachusetts. As part of this crackdown on smuggling, the British passed a law called the Writ of Assistance, allowing the British to board any colonial vessel for any reason they deem necessary and order a search. It is for this very reason that we have search warrants. Yes, it is for this very reason that you have the right to privacy because prior to the American Revolution, because of the writ of assistance, British soldiers, I think police officers, could go on to any colonial ship, think of your vehicle, and begin to search it with no reason. Now, their purpose was to cut down on smuggling. And yeah, there was smuggling. Their purpose was to eliminate pirates. And sure, there were pirates. But their methods were seen as a violation of colonial civil liberties. Because British subjects weren't subject to search without a warrant. But now colonial subjects are being subject to search without a warrant. And that's messed up. Also, because of the conflicts, British soldiers had been stationed in American colonies to serve as police and protection. And this made the colonists feel threatened. Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, George Grenville, set policies to pay off the debt that had been incurred throughout the war. As part of the debt repayment plan, a new tax would be levied on the American colonies. This tax was called the Sugar Act. Duties would be placed on imports. Duties is another word for tax. And so taxes would be placed on uh, finished products that were sold from Britain to the American colonies. And smuggling now would come with a much higher penalty. It would go to a military court. Remember, that was part of the drama that we talked about last week, that when smuggling was going to a military court, it led the American colonists to arrest Governor Andros and set up their own courts. Of course, the purpose of these taxes was to pay off Britain's war debt, But it actually led to a loss of profits from trade for the American colony. So it hurt the colonists severely. 